everyone. Welcome to Christ Chapel. We're glad you're here and part of our service this morning. Whether you're in person or online, thank you for joining us. And our service this morning, we will have some music, we'll have a message, and then we will be having communion today. So if you are here, they'll pass that out at that time. If you're online, uh, hopefully you can get some type of bread and some type of a, a beverage to go with it so that you can partake, partake with us as we uh, honor Christ and what Christ has done for us. We'll also take prayer requests, and again, if you're here, we'll ask you about those at that time. And if you're online, if you could take the next 30 minutes or so and put those in the comment section so that there's time for those to be transposed and, uh, and texted over to me, I would appreciate it. So we're glad you're here today as we're here to worship and celebrate our God. So let's go to God in prayer this morning. God, we thank you for your presence, your power, and your might. We thank you for what you're doing in each of our hearts and each of our lives. And God, we just thank you that we can abide in you and have you as just flowing through our lives through the power of your Holy Spirit. So God, we ask that you minister to each heart and each life, that you guide us and direct us, O oh God, as we commit this service to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So at this time, our music team will come forward and lead us out in song. So please stand, if you will, and join in.
God. You may be seated, and thank you for team for bringing those beautiful songs to us, and I'm, <laughs> yes. and reminding us of the powerful name we have in the name of Jesus. So we're just so grateful for that power. And again, with them rehearsing on singing "Let It Rain," I think God I heard their prayer, and it actually rained on us this morning, which I don't think any of us expected it. But we're hoping for that raining of the Holy Spirit within our heart and our life to guide us and direct us through all the things that God has for us. So again, thank you, team, for leading us out in song. Well, we are leading up to Easter. We are in the middle of Lent, or in the middle of getting in, or entering into Lent, and we've been looking at the I Am statements from the Bible, and so we're going to continue looking at them until Easter, which is only a month away. So in a month from today, we will be celebrating Palm Sunday, if you can believe it. In five weeks from today, we will be having our world-renowned potluck, so you'll want to be a part of that. Uh, bring, we're obviously back to the crock pot still, for, so if you some type of a dish that can either be cold or can stay heated because uh, we don't have the ovens and things like we used to have. And so start getting your favorite dish together, your Easter bonnets ready, because Easter will be here before we know it. But in the process, we are continuing to look at the I Am statements. We started by looking at uh, the part where Moses uh, identified, was identified as the great I Am uh, to Moses, and so, or God was identified as the great I Am to Moses. And then we see in the New Testament, Jesus starts giving us the I Am statements. And we've looked at so far, I am the bread of life, I am the light, I am the gate, and today we're going to look at I am the vine. How Jesus is that vine that we are uh, the branches that are grafted together. And the discourse that this happened in was right at the time of the Last Supper. It was during Passover. These are some of Jesus' last words to his disciples, which lets us know the importance that we need to follow these instructions. He's given these people this guide, the ones who are going to take this ministry and lead it into changing our world. And so these are the last words, he, some of the last words he speaks, and it's in John 15, 1 through 8. It says, I am the vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I have remained in you, and no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown in the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is my, to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. There's some tough stuff in there. There's parts of those things in that passage I'm wishing Jesus had left out because I'm such a strong believer of God's grace and love and acceptance that it's like anyone being cut off. But verse 3 at least helps us understand that he says, you may be pruned back and you're already clean, he says in this passage as well, because we know his word. So this cut off part would not be about those who our followers of Christ are attempting to, uh, doing their best that they can, but it's those who won't allow the work of Christ in their life. So don't get fearful. If you're worried about being cut off, then I can almost guarantee you it's not talking about you. Because if you're about to be cut off, you wouldn't care. You, wouldn't, you already removed yourself from the life of Christ, so it wouldn't matter to you. So, but these words were directed to this, his disciples to remind them, you need to keep relationship with me. Don't try to do this work that I'm set, setting you out to do on your own. That this is for those who actually do want to build a relationship. That this is more than the get out of hell free card. It's one of, so many people just want enough of Jesus to get inside the gate. Just so I, a little cabin in a corner of heaven is all I want. That's the B word. It's just not going to be. People want more than that from God. They want a relationship. So Jesus, as he's getting ready to send them out in the world, he wants to be sure that they know they don't go in their own strength. That whenever they do what God has called them to do, it's at the power of God. It's as they stay connected to what God has in their life. And, and Peter, poor Apostle Peter, he gets 
such bad press because of his personality and the way he's just out there. But we know that even for him, he immediately demonstrates what happens when you try to go on your own power. They are in the Garden of Gethsemane. The temple guards are coming to arrest Jesus. And so Peter is going to defend Jesus. And so he takes a sword and he swings to cut off a soldier's head and he misses and cuts off Malchus's ear, who then changed his name to Vincent Van Gogh. No, that's not true. <laughs> that's addition there. But he cuts off his ear instead. And here Peter is trying to defend Jesus in his own power. Now luckily I think, it, yeah, Luke twenty two fifty one. 51 Thankfully, Jesus heals Malchus's ear, so Peter isn't arrested and, or, nor killed from that. But soon after this, he still, he's defended Jesus and his own power didn't do so well. He then denies who Jesus is. So he's now at this point of feeling like a complete failure. We see then that just a little bit later, as this is happening, Jesus then, when Jesus rises again, he meets with Peter, reinstates him, lets him know he's forgiven, and then we see something mighty happen in Acts 2, where the Holy Spirit descends upon the disciples. Peter is one who is now grafted into this branch of Christ and no longer trying to do it on his own. And what do we see in Acts chapter 2? One of the greatest sermons ever written to where over 3,000 people came to know Jesus that day. His words became effective, and we know it isn't because of Peter's own ability. His whole life shows it's not in what he could do, but in what God was able to do through him. So he's instructing to us the things that as we remain in Christ, as we follow him, that's where our focus is, what Jesus' life will bring to us. Now, the NIV uses the word remain, but I grew up with the King James Version, you know, the one that Paul wrote. Uh, so the King James Version is one that we, that we grew up with. So I'm going to use the word abide because that just sticks with me. It sounds, it's just a word that fits for me. But the word, the Greek word does mean to abide, to remain, to continue, to dwell, and to be present. Will you be present here today in the things of God and allow God's presence to be with you? So I'm gonna, I have some questions that we're going to look at today. And the first one is, what does it mean to abide in Christ? What does it mean to remain or continue in Christ? Well, Jesus gives this visual aid of a grapevine, helps us understand that, that as you're grafted in, you're going to stay there, and that those who are grafted in grow, those who are cut off die. And as horrible as the storm was last week, we're grateful for the rain. We needed to get out of this drought. But we still know what happened to those trees during that storm that in, we'll go over to the park and it was full of dead branches that had fallen off. Those branches, branches wither and die and they make a big mess. And sadly, that's what happens with us when we don't stay connected to the vine. We dry up, we wither, and in a lot of cases we make a big mess. So we see that, we, that in this mess, it's a, it's a good illustration for us to see that we continue our relationship with God. And that should we also, by things of our life that have drifted us away from Christ to where we feel like we've walked away from God, thankfully this gardener that we have can graft us back in and restore life to us. This is the God that we serve. But when we stay connected to Christ, it is so much better for us. This connection means we're just abiding with God, allowing the Holy Spirit of God to guide us, to direct us. And we saw this with the example of the disciples. They too were a big mess before Pentecost. They too were struggling with life before Pentecost. But when they allowed the Holy Spirit of God to work within them, they changed our world. And we too will begin to see as we stay connected to the things of God, as we allow the word of God to speak to our heart and our life, that we too will begin to see ways to be fruitful in the kingdom of God. That we too will bear fruit. And the thing about bearing fruit is it means other people are going to pluck it and eat it. We don't get to hold on to it. You ever see those branches that are just overloaded with fruit? They just start dragging the ground. They're not really useful unless it is given to other people for nourishment and strength, refreshing of their soul. Now, a lot of us grew up in evangelical circles, and we know that to bear fruit meant you're going to be a soul winner for Jesus. 
You're going to get out there and get as many notches in your Bible as you possibly can because the more people you win for Jesus, the more spiritual you are. That may be part of it, of letting people know, but it's mostly what's God doing in your heart? Are you bearing fruit? Are there things in your life that's producing things around you that others are seeing the work of God in you? Now, hopefully you're starting to memorize this passage because I've been using it a lot lately, but are you bearing the fruit of Galatians 5, 22 and 23? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And then Paul reminds them, against such there is no law of Moses that says you can't have this. There's no law in our world that would say you can't have this. This is that part of that abiding with Christ that starts transforming us from the inside out. And as this inside out starts happening, we start bearing fruit to our world. So then why do we abide in Christ? What's the purpose of it? We're told to bear fruit, but why does that really matter? I mean, I'm connected to Christ. That's good enough for me. I'm, I'm swaying in the breeze. I'm good here. But he wants us to bear fruit. As we bear fruit, we began to look at this world differently. We start dealing with the way Je the, this world the way Jesus did. And how did Jesus deal with this world? With a heart of compassion. He saw people who were in need. So this life of Christ does start from the inside out, but as we experience this love of Jesus, then this love of Jesus that we've experienced should flow out of us to those around us. Are we seeing our world through the eyes of Christ? It's not just that we experience love, joy, and peace in our own heart and life, although that's part of it, but as we experience it, are we sharing it? Are we bearing fruit where others around us are also receiving love, joy, peace from us, through us, through our work? It's not so much about us, is it? When we start seeing things the way Jesus did, we start seeing it about others. We won't amount to much if we aren't sharing the fruit that we're bearing. We've got to share the fruit that we bear. And it was the compassion that we saw in Jesus that caused him to reach out from possibly his own comfort zone. He was human, even though he was God. But there were probably some areas where he had to reach out beyond his own comfort zone to do what God had called him to do because of that heart of compassion and caring. In Matthew 9, 36, it says, And when he, Jesus, saw the crowd, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus saw their need. Other passages that I don't have a verse for uh, on the screen for you, we talk about when he saw the crowds, he had compassion, moved with compassion, and healed all who were present. Through his compassion, he saw the needs of other people. Through his compassion, we see John 3.16 yet again, for God so loved that he gave. As we allow God to love through us, we start giving ourselves to this world, and we even sing a song sometimes, I give myself away so that you can use me. Do we mean it? Or is it, I'll give myself away as long as it's convenient. But will we give ourselves away when we see others who are in need, that need of compassion? And as that love of Christ abides in us and through us, then we start looking around to see, how can I be used for the kingdom of God? If I'm bearing fruit, and this fruit is hanging off of my branch, how do I share this fruit with those who are in need? Well, there's an old definition of ministry that I've heard probably all of my life, that we're all called to ministry. And the definition of ministry, basically, is see a need and meet it. If you see a need and meet it, you are in ministry because that's what Jesus did. This seeing a need and meet it is in our church family, in our communities, our neighborhoods, our work, our school. Where will we ask God to give us the eyes of to see the heart of compassion as Jesus had for those who are around us who are helpless, who are harassed, who just need healing in their life? Will we look beyond ourselves to others? Will we be poured out into our community? Because as we look at church history, we find out that is what helped change the world. 
our Ivory League schools were created by Christian organizations for the purpose of educating people to carry this message of God to the world. Many of our hospitals all began from religious organizations that felt, saw a need and started to meet it. That's why whenever people get all this thing about is medical, can we have medical science and faith in God? Well, obviously we can because that's what got hospitals started in this country in the beginning. Our homeless situation is met mostly by religious organizations who go out to do the work. Even uh, Hope of the Valley isn't necessarily a religious organization, but I know Ken Kraft is definitely a believer in God. So we start seeing how God puts these things on people's hearts to help them see the need around them and think, what can I do? And we can look at the need, and it's so far beyond us, but that's where we ask for God to open up doors, open up those ways, give us those thoughts and ideas of who we can bring around to help to take care of those needs that we see in our world. And when you see something lacking, if God's brought it to your attention, then know that God's speaking to you about it. And it's not for you to pass off to somebody else and say, you know, I think you need to take care of this situation. God's going to put it on your heart. What can you do? What can you do to bear fruit to see changes in our world? And we may even do some things that we attempt to do and realize I'm not really good at this. And too often when people have done that, that they get gung-ho in a situation and it doesn't quite turn out the way they want, they feel like if they step back, it's going to be embarrassment for them. Don't be ashamed of that. You took a step forward. You took a step of faith. And maybe it wasn't directed exactly where you needed to go, but know God, that through your step of faith, God knows you are able to move to where else you need to go, to that next place where you will be a fit. Don't give up. Keep trying to find the next place where you know that it is what is right for you. We used to say in Bible college, it's a lot easier for God to move a vehicle that's, to steer a vehicle that's moving rather than one that's setting still. As long as we're moving in faith with God, allow God to direct you where to go. Just have that heart of compassion to see what God has for you. I mean, even in our own church family, there may be things that you see that we need that you might think, you know, someone needs to, and just hear God say that someone could be you. We do outreach ministry, but it would be nice to have an outreach coordinator to make those things happen, who could pull together the booths and the designs and to the people and everything that happens. We do it, but it'd be a lot easier with a coordinator. Social events, our leadership team, we're doing bowling, thanks to Frank helping pull that together, but we're going to do events at times that are social, but it would be a lot easier if we had someone who took on that responsibility. We're talking about bringing up back Bible study. It's great. We need those times in the Word. Has God laid on your heart to teach? That you could step up and say, Pastor, I know you can't do it every week. I'll help. These are things that we look and we see a need and pray, God, that, uh, that God will allow us to meet it. We need these things. Bearing fruit does mean that we may be plucked by others and have to give away and where we feel like we're being drained, but that's where we go back to our source for that strength and help that we need. And it's not just in our church, but sometimes even in the little things of life, we just be observant. Where can I help somebody in need today? What is it I can do? And, and we always go for the grand gestures. We always go for the big things because those are the most obvious to us. But what about just watching someone in need in your neighborhood? The other day, our, where we're uh, living, where it looks out over a parking area, and one of our neighbors had a fairly new van, but it, evidently the, sky, the um, window on top leaks on it. Um, and so he was out there trying to put a tarp on the car, and he would get the tarp up and go on the other side, and the wind had blown it back. And he kept doing this a couple of times. And I was just about to get up to go out there. And then his teenage son, who I'm sure he asked an hour earlier, comes slowly <laughs> sauntering out to help. But there's this thing, just being observant. Could I help? What can I do? To, and those are ways that we just bear fruit in the world around us. It's those small steps. And then Jesus tells us also, well, why do we do this? Why do we even care? Why should we have compassion for others? Why should that matter? Well, in John 15, 8, Jesus said... <clears throat> This is to my Father's glory 
that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciple. We glorify God. And we always talk about wanting to glorify God, but are we allowing it by bearing fruit in our life? Too many want this glory for themselves. I'll help as long as my name gets on the building. I'll help as long as I get thanked publicly. I'll help as long as everybody knows what all I've done. Will we help if all the glory goes to God alone? Those are the things that are sometimes tough for us. We used to sing a song years ago, In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, be glorified today. And I think a lot of us sang that with the idea of thinking, I'll get the radiance of Moses, and I will walk, and people will just know the radiance of God is all around me because they can see your glow off of my face. Rather than thinking, our hard work, our difficult things we do, brings glory back to God. It gives God the acknowledgement that God should have. Will we glorify Christ and allow Christ's life to shine through us? no matter who gets the credit, because it's going to glorify God. In fact, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Apostle Paul wrote, <clears throat> whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. We are the image of God in this world. We are God's hands, God's feet, God's voice. And as we do the work in the kingdom of God, we bring glory to God. And once we see the benefit of why we should abide in Christ, that it brings glory to God, then it should encourage us then, if this is going to glorify God, it's God that can change this world and make things better. And it's not that point of the people will see how holy I am or how self-righteous I am, because, again, that other saying, we become so uh, heavenly-minded, we become no earthly good. That can happen if we try to make it all about us. But Jesus the perfect, sinless Son of God, gave himself completely, when definitely Jesus didn't need to do that, out of his love and grace for us. He dealt with the self-righteous and the wicked. He cared for those in need, and it demonstrated glory back to God. That should be our motivation, that we want to give God glory. And the last question we're going to look at is, uh, leads to the question, I, I think I wrote how well, oh no, I got how do, okay. How do we abide in Christ? Then how do we abide in Christ? What's the purpose? How does this work? Well, are you ready for an amazing new revelation? Are you ready for one that's just going to blow you away? One that changes everything you've ever believed? Let's read what Jesus said. John 15, 7. If you remain in me, as we've been talking about, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. So what are the two ways, this great revelation of how we abide in Christ? Through God's word and through prayer. So are you disappointed? It's like, are you shocked, thinking, oh, I was hoping for something a lot more? Are you maybe relieved? It's that thing to know, these are things we can do to stay connected to God. Very simple. It's a tale as old as time, and I'm not talking about beauty and the beast. Unless Jesus is the beauty and we're the beast. We are being transformed as we stay in connection with Christ. But Jesus' words remain in you. As they abide in you, that Greek word, he says, as you listen to my words, that Greek word for word means spoken word. The things that Jesus said, are we applying them to our life? Jesus was God, so we know we can expand this to all of God's word that was spoken to us. And our whole Bible was spoken, except for the Ten Commandments. That's the only place where we know God's finger wrote. Because Moses said God's finger wrote those things down, the Ten Commandments. Do we even know those? Could we quote those, what those are? Do we understand what it's saying in those ten? But everything else was the spoken word of God that was given to people who wrote it down for us to follow. They listened to the word of God, and they helped us to grow in our knowledge of God our understanding of God, so that we can operate in the kingdom of God. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it tells us all scripture. Now, remember, the New Testament wasn't compiled here, so when, when Paul is saying, the Apostle Paul is writing about all scripture, he's referring to Hebrew scripture. He's saying all scripture is God-breathed, is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, 
and training in righteousness, that right relationship with God, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Why was the word of God given? So that we can do the good works that, what do they do? We read in this passage, give glory to God. So again, we don't do good works to be a Christian. We do good works because we are one, because we want to bring glory unto God as we should in our life. In 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, it says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So again, there's, well, it's just written by man. The Bible was written by man. We really don't need to pay attention to it. Well, this helps us understand it was maybe been written by human, but it was spoken by God. It was inspired by God. And it even says that they don't get to write what they thought it should be. They could only write what God instructed them to be, which then gives us the understanding we can't just go through the Bible, pick out a verse, grab it from wherever it fits in context, and apply it and say, oh, this verse is for me. It's what God wants me to do. We need to look at the whole of what God is saying because that's what's got people in trouble. We need to know the purpose and the intent of what Scripture was written that's why the Bible study is so important, so that we know how to look at the Bible. It's fine to ask, what does this verse mean to me? But don't stop there. If you stop there, it becomes just a personal interpretation that may not be what God intended. But it's okay to understand where, I'm underst where, where do I see this passage applying right now in my life. But then you've got to go the next step. What is the context? What was the culture? To whom was it written? What do I know about the original language? How will this help me understand what God is speaking to me? It's those things that help stir up that hunger for the Bible, to help us know that we want the Word of God in our life so that we learn more about God. As we learn more about God, we stay connected to God, so then God's life flows through us. It all works in this whole chain reaction together. And there's those people who do know the Word of God, they can quote a verse no matter what you throw at them. That's great, it's impressive, but it doesn't mean anything unless it's working from the inside out, unless we are applying it to the things of God and allowing God's word to transform us. As James 1.22 says, don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says, otherwise you're only fooling yourself. The word of God must remain in us. We must absorb it. We must allow the word of God to help us know how to act. And yes, we get it. There are things in the Bible that are cultural. There, that's why we have to sift it through that lens of what was culturally happening then. How do we work it together? And yes, it is very patriarchal. The Hebrew scripture was written by men. So it does come with that. Even though God inspired, it would have that leaning. In fact, if you, I just read this week of where if a husband is jealous, he could bring his wife to the temple, and it was pretty bizarre what happened in that situation, but it was only if the man was jealous of the woman, not if the woman was jealous of the man. And it just shows again that women were, were, didn't have that right, because um, we know women are jealous just as much as men are, but it was just that they weren't allowed any way to deal with their jealousy. So we get it. There are cultural things you gotta look at. They have made it very patriarchal. However, if you look at scripture, we see over and over again where God used women as leaders, as prophets, as teachers, as strength. They were the ones with the strength. They guided. They were the victors. Tomorrow is the Jewish celebration of Purim. It's where a woman saved Israel. So we know that God uses it. And yes, it may be written from a patriarchal stance, but we know all genders are inclusive in the scripture of what God is saying. In fact, in the Hebrew scriptures, Joel the prophet, Joel 2, 28 and 29, afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, will preach. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see vision. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Those days have been here for a while. 
Those days where God is pouring out his spirit on all flesh is happening. We saw it with our congregation, even as congregations like ours have raised up. It's the spirit of God letting it know, let us know that God pours out his spirit on all people. I grew up four square, so Amy Simple McPherson is a hero of mine. In fact, I have her pulpit chair in my home. Got her pictures and things because she was an inspiration. That if a woman could be a pastor, whenever it wasn't cool at all to be a pastor, then I could be a gay one. She had the, one of the first mega churches in this country as a female. Salvation Army, founded by a woman. Oh, and the thing with also what Amy started was 100 years ago. They're celebrating their 100th anniversary. Her work continues. Saddleback Church recently got thrown out of the Southern Baptist Convention for ordaining a woman. Things are changing. We are seeing the Spirit of God move to where these that would have been staunch saying, that can't happen. It can't happen that, th that women be preachers. We're seeing that even though it's been known for many years, over a century now and beyond, well, all throughout Scripture we see women being raised up, we're seeing even those that were always opposed are now starting to break down that barrier, which gives me hope about the LGBTQ community. To let us know that if that wall can bear break down, then eventually the one for us can as well. But as we see that as this Holy Spirit works in the Word of God, as it guides us and directs us and leads us, then we start understanding the heart of God. Not the letter of the law, but the spirit of it. What is God speaking to us? How can we apply it? And it helps us grow. And that's why Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is alive and active sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The kingdom of God helps us to be able to abide in, the, in, in Christ. The second way is through prayer. He uses the word ask. So we know that asking is a way that we can go before God and present our needs before God, but it is a word of communication that we communicate with God. Prayer is so important. We have great prayer warriors in our church, and uh, Catherine is over our prayer ministry. If there are questions you have about prayer, I know she's talked to people on how to pray, ways to pray. She, she'll help you with those things, so be sure and talk to her about it because she does know the value of prayer for sure. And we all need this in our life. We all need to have that time alone with God. And as this passage goes on, did you see it even says that you can ask anything that you wish, that you desire, and it'll be done? Wow, that is a strong statement. But did you see who gets this? Those who remain in the vine. Why? Why can Jesus so boldly state that anything you ask, you're going to get if you desire it, as long as you stay connected to the vine. Because if the Spirit of God is flowing through us, if the Spirit of God is in our heart and in our mind, then we're not going to be praying selfish prayers. We're going to be praying for the cares of those around us. Jesus' heart of compassion were those around and things that were happening. And so it's not about what I get, what I want, and yes, those may be my fleshly desires, but as we stay connected to God and we learn more about Jesus and his work in this world, God's plan for all of eternity, we start understanding it more, our wishes will change. Our heart's desires will change to where our prayers will be, God, how can I help other people? That love of people around us will override our love for self. So instead of asking and wishing for that big house that's way too large for one family, I'll use the example of a person who's in the news lately. Jimmy Carter is an example of one who lived modestly and gave. There are things that we can do in our life to know that we can still honor God. We can still have things, we just don't let our things have us. And we've heard that prayer changes things, but Oswald Chambers wrote it a little differently. He adds, prayer changes people, and people change things. As that inward working of God happens in our heart, as we allow God to work within us, then we start being transformed as an individual. And as we begin to be transformed, we start seeing ways to transform this world. 
That's the way change is going to happen. I've given up on politics helping us do anything. I've given up on some of our brothers and sisters in Christ being able to help us do anything because it's just become too political. But whenever we see that as we start allowing Christ to transform our lives and transform other people, then we start seeing ways to help and make a difference in our world. It's through this communication with God that we start being able to see people as helpless, harassed, and how many in our world today are sheep without a shepherd? There are so many people who have left churches today because of what has happened in the Christian Church of America. We need to be ones that say, see this heart of calling them back to the God who loves them and cares for them. Because the first church that ever existed, they changed the world in a pretty short period of time. They weren't that big a group at first until after Peter's sermon. And then all of a sudden, there were thousands of people who followed them. But what did they do? How did they make a change in their world? Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which would be the word of God, and to fellowship, meeting together, coffee and baked goods help, to the breaking of bread, which means communion, and to prayer. That was their ministry. And they changed the world. So as we allow Christ to work in our life, as we abide in Christ and allow the love of Christ to flow through us, the life of Christ to flow through us, we bear fruit, and as we bear fruit, yes, it's going to be plucked, some will misuse it, but it will nurture and support and strengthen others in their walk with God. And we become like little Christ to our world. So when Jesus said, I am the vine, and gave us this visual aid, he's helping us see the importance of staying connected to Christ. So I do have some discussion questions for you to look at this week as, um, to think about. What does abiding in Christ mean? How is abiding in Christ flowing out of your life into the world around you? Have you seen God glorified as you've been abiding in Christ? And how has your study of God's word helped you to learn more about God and to remain in Christ? And how are you developing your prayer life? What tools are you using to assist you in times of prayer? Now, that one, I actually have a prayer app, and it does help because it brings, I can list my name, and it'll come up, list the, uh, bring the list up for me um, as I pray. So it's things that can help us, things that are beneficial to us. So may we abide in Christ and allow Christ to abide in us. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your visual aids that make it, so clear of what you're talking about that we have to stay connected to you and letting your life flow through our life. And we know it's through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. So God, allow us to be able to be like you, to look out at our world with eyes of compassion, with hearts of compassion, to see ways that we can meet the needs of those who are around us, and maybe not the ones that are so drastically obvious, but the small needs of people in our life that we come across, just making us alert and aware of situations that you can allow us to be that, that help, that strength, that nourishment that someone else may need. God, guide us in our walk with you. Allow us to follow after you. In Jesus' name, amen. So at this time, we will be having communion. So... Uh, I think if they, they're going, Marcos and Sherry will walk down the aisle if you don't have the communion yet. If you're at home, I encourage you to um, to have some type of bread and juice, doesn't, or a liquid doesn't have to be juice, but something to remind you of what Christ has done. Because that's what cum communion is all about. It's another visual aid given to us to help us understand the spiritual truth. It's not that there's anything magical about this bread or about this juice. It's about what happens in our heart and in our life. That as we partake, we're bringing Christ into ourself, and then we go out into our world with the strength of Christ within us. So it's just a simple way, a simple illustration of Christ working through us. We know he did this by going to the cross. As he gave his life, as the broken bread, as he gave his, shed his blood for our salvation. That's all it takes to be in right standing with God. 
just accepting and understanding what Christ has done. So we do honor Christ. We celebrate what Christ has done, and so we remember the day. It was the night that Christ was betrayed. He had gathered around him those who he loved, those who supported and encouraged him. And he took the bread, as he got it out of the plastic wrapper, he took the bread, raised to the Father. He blessed it and broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me, in remembrance of the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ. like manner he took the cup raised to the father and blessed it as well and said this cup represents the new testament in my blood this do in remembrance of me in remembrance of the shed blood of our lord jesus christ for as often as we eat the bread drink the cup remember his death till his glorious return that is the abiding with christ the simple act of communion that just lets us know christ is in us we go into our world. So we'll go to prayer requests. Um, Christine has a praise report. Kelly's last scan shows that the chemo is working. Yes, praise God for that. The uh, tumor has decreased 20 to 30 percent. Uh, her next round of chemo starts next week. And uh, just thanks everyone for their prayers and continuing prayers for Kelly, who's been dealing with cancer for half of her life now. So uh, keep her in prayer. Uh, are there needs on your heart you'd like to have on there? Okay. Okay. Yikes. Okay. <laughs> She's coming to you. Uh, our friend Beth, uh, the Elman Heart, is... Uh, sick and she's um, uh, she's got some uh, issues going on um, physically. It's also kind of getting her down too, so okay. just keep her in prayer for that. Okay. Um, Ashley and the kids will be going to Salt Lake to um, Brandon's funeral, so traveling mercies and, and continued prayer for the family. All right, let's go to God in prayer. God, we thank you that not only do we bring our praise and adoration, but we can also bring our prayers unto you as well. So God, we bring these needs that have been vocalized to you, oh God. We, we thank you for the report that Christine uh, sent us about Kelly. We thank you, oh God, for that, uh, your work in her heart and her life and in her being. We ask you continue to bring healing. God, we ask that you give her strength, that you, uh, she has such an amazing attitude, Lord, that you just continue to uh, encourage her and to be with her and uh, help her as she uh, battles this cancer in her life. And we pray, oh God, as she goes into chemo this next week, that your hand will be upon her. Give her body the ability to, to withstand it, to have the strength to uh, deal with the, what's happening, and God, that this tumor will completely go away, the tumors in the name of Jesus, that you uh, give her complete health and healing. We know you are our God who heals us. By your stripes, we are healed, and we pray for this for Kelly, oh God, that you continually heal her and in her life. We pray for Ron, oh God, as he uh, celebrates his birthday. We ask a blessing on his life, but you also need know his needs of um, financial needs. And God, we know that you can open up the right door for employment for him. And we ask, oh God, that you give him the guidance he needs, the direction he needs, and that he find the, the right fit for him. We pray for Connie, oh God, as she uh, returns to Texas, oh Lord, for uh, housing, for uh, her well-being, for her health. Oh God, we ask that you uh, be with her and provide for her and take care of her. God, we ask that you also be with Beth, and we ask that you minister health and healing to her body, and Lord, that you give her strength, and as, um, as she's just uh, getting older, oh Lord, that you give her body the ability to fight these infections and things that come upon her. Uh, give her just strength and encouragement, oh God. Lord, we pray for Ashley and the kids as they travel. We ask that you uh, help them have a safe trip, that it be a, a time of them to be together, even though it's for a, a reason that's, that's sad for them as they have uh, lost a brother and an uncle. Lord, we ask that you be with that family, that you bring peace and comfort to their heart and to their minds as they 
uh, as they go through the process of grieving. Lord, be with them, guide them, and direct them. God, you know the other needs in our heart and our life that may not have been made public, but you know the things that we wish weren't in our life. So God, we ask that you intervene in those circumstances, that you give us your guidance, your understanding, your wisdom, and your grace. We thank you, O oh God, for all you're doing in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, John will, is coming to um, present the announcements to us. So we've got a few things happening. Good morning, everyone. Um, also, thank you for praying for my family with my uncle's passing last month. It felt really good um, to be a part of a church family, so thank you. Um, so if it's your first time here, we have welcome cards for those who um, are our guests, be a part of this family. It's great. It feels good. Um, the cards are in the racks on the pew in front of you. I'm going to try and go time it with this. Let's see. Bowling. All right. Bowling. Any bowlers? Okay. A couple. I'm going bowling. So um, this is actually going to be really fun. I went before. I think it was maybe 2018. Yeah. Um, it's at Corbin Bowl, March 26th at noon, $15. You can sign up, I believe, in the back by Sherry and also where the food is located. And then pain is going to be to be determined. Okay, Frank over here is taking payment. How do we just... Mary and Joseph Retreat Center. We have the retreat coming up again, July 7th through the 9th. 9th. The gates open. I love that it says gates. The gates open at 4 p.m. Um, we leave noon on Sunday. Estimated re registration fee is $300 per person. And for a single room, $375. printouts. Um, our church family is going to be collecting gift card donations for a family in need this Easter. Um, the family recently moved into permanent housing and they have two children. Um, in lieu of clothing and home goods, we are asking for gift cards. Helpful gift cards can be purchased from any home appliance stores, Target, Best Buy, um, clothing stores, Old, Old Navy, Ross, Love Ross, Kohl's, grocery stores, um, and then we'll be collecting gift cards through Easter Sunday. And where do they? Okay, there'll be a basket in the back. Um, when and if you have those. Oh, also, time change next Sunday. Can't believe that already. M March 12th is the time change. Um, be sure to spring forward one hour next Saturday or early Sunday before you go to bed or just rely on your phone, which is what I do. Um, also, prayer requests can be put in the box on the back cabinet. Um, the donation box is the wood box. That's the prayer box, sorry. That's the prayer box, the wood box. And then do the donation box is behind that wall by the window. Yes. And on that note, let's bow our heads over the tithes and offerings, as well as for the building fund. Um, dear God, we just come before you, and we thank you for this amazing building, and I thank you for this church family, and we just ask that you continue to bless this family, all of us, and guide us when to give to the building as well as to the church to supply its needs for this great time here. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you. So as we sing, as the music team leads us out in song.
sure to join us in the back. There are a lot of treats back there. You gotta at least check them out and uh, enjoy the food, enjoy the fellowship, and enjoy the love of Christ in your life as you go out into our world. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Our God is an awesome